Hi, my name's Keith Kelly, and I'm going to talk about life skills and English. Um, you can see my email address if there are any questions afterwards. Don't hesitate to get in touch. <coughs> I was asked by Jordan Stoyanov, uh, who's the Macmillan rep for Bulgaria, to prepare for this presentation workshop on life skills in English alongside a Macmillan course book called Open Mind. Uh, and I got really quite excited about the idea of looking at how to develop a curriculum for uh, skills and competencies useful for life beyond school. And at the same time, uh, offering a context for learning the English language. So that's really what we're going to talk about here. And um, <coughs> it's particularly relevant in the European context where you can see uh, wide extremes in youth unemployment. So we'll, we'll contextualise this in the European workplace. We'll look at what the EU uh, is suggesting young people need to have in terms of skills when they leave school. And we'll look at what that means for learning languages and learning communication skills. There's a bridge there to classroom practice, because in a way we need to look at what it means for how things should change in a classroom to accommodate life skills in a language learning programme. And here we'll touch on um, cultural communication and what it means to have skills for communicating between cultures. I'll offer a model for communication in the classroom, science across the world, and we'll, we'll finish by um, covering some ideas for following up so teachers can, uh, can take it a little further and, and create their own contacts between schools and colleagues in other schools. And I'll offer some places where you might look to do that. Let's start with the European context. This slide is really quite interesting because it shows from November 2013 unemployment rates for young people uh, and if you look at Spain with mm, pushing 60% youth unemployment in November 2013 uh, and compare that with a country like Austria which still isn't over the 10% unemployment mark in the same period uh, Bulgaria we can see there is pushing 30% according to uh, official figures. So what's happening in Spain? Young people are, are lacking opportunity in, in the workplace and what sort of skills can they develop to help them become more employable and more mobile is a very important question for teachers. Look, a closer look at Austrian data I found this in order to show it to a group of Austrian teachers I was working with and compare that with other countries in Europe. This is up to January 2014. Shows youth unemployment has just sne sneaked over 10% mark, but it's still pretty good, you know, on a European scale. Young Austrians have got a lot more opportunities open to them than many other young people in Europe in the workplace. Excuse me. And well, mobility and employability in the European context are key uh, terms um, used in European educational institutions. And questions we should ask are: What is it that makes young people mobile? Well, one um, area to look at in answering that question is that knowing languages, knowing foreign languages, and it's. Um, no secret that the Council of Europe wants young people to leave school with three community languages. And what makes young people employable? Well, this is an area that my colleague Dan um, gave me a lot of information that's very, very useful, very interesting, is the area of soft skills uh, as much as hard technical skills. Uh, so we'll have a look at that. What, what are these soft skills that um, employers say young people are lacking so much in uh, in their interviews, in their first arrival at a new uh, post in their companies. According to the Seattle Jobs Initiative 2013, in answer to the question, 
how important are soft skills to securing entry level employment at your company? 60% of employers surveyed said that they are as important as technical skills, hard skills, skills you need to operate in a certain technical environment. Interestingly, more important than these technical skills, 17% of employers suggest that they're more important. So these soft skills, um, business and the workplace tell us are essential for young people arriving for jobs. And what are these skills? Well, a slight pause for you to think about that. <coughs> um, teachers frequently say um, negotiation skills, presentation skills, and in fact, the, a, a lot of international organisations highlight uh, these skill areas for the purpose of encouraging educational systems to incorporate them and push them more strongly in the curriculum. Personal management, social skills, <laughs> functioning on an independent basis from the International Bureau of Education. The World Health Organization highlights psychosocial skills. <coughs> um, and finally, we've got UNESCO highlights several skills, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, negotiation skills is there, being able to make independent decisions. The UK Commission for Employment and Skills Report in 2014. If you look at all of these uh, skills, apart from the top one, they're a summary of these soft skills that companies say young people lack planning and organisation. And you can look at language specific skills like oral communication skills and written communication skills, you know, apart from foreign language skills. Team working skills and literacy skills are all related in, in a very clear way to what we do in the language classroom. Uh, the Institute of Engineering and Technology Annual Survey in 2013 um, do you find that the typical new school leaver recruit, graduate recruit, postgraduate recruit, experienced staff recruit to an engineering, IT or technical role does not meet your reasonable expectations in any of the following particular skill areas. And if you look at uh, communication skills, for example, it suggests that graduates and school leavers, 20% lack basic communication skills. Um, leadership skills, up to 25% of post of graduates lack uh, essential leadership, leadership skills, literacy skills. School leavers, pushing 20% of school leavers lack necessary literary skills. And further down, we've got teamwork uh, skills down there. Across the board, pushing 8%, 7 8% lacking teamwork skills. Now, what are the top 10 skills that employers say they want? A University of Kent study uh, of multiple surveys suggests these are the top 10 skills highlighted by employers and you know there's, n there's not really much point in going into the ones specifically related to the language curriculum it's obvious what uh, the language curriculum offers in terms of opportunity for practicing a lot of these skills but what about a course that is created specifically based on what we know about these soft skills for young people some other skills from the same survey um, negotiating and persuading skills there, action planning and decision making. How much of that is part and parcel of any curriculum subject, uh, let alone language learning? I wanted to show a model for intercultural communicative education I came across doing my own master's degree many years ago that I've uh, kept in mind when working with programs that get young people collaborating uh, across geographical borders and between languages. And here we've got two uh, example cultures, culture A and culture B. You might imagine uh, British culture and Bulgarian culture. And what this um, uh, 
this schema suggests is that in order to be a good communicator across cultures, in order to be interculturally, communicatively competent, you need to be able to do four things, to be able to see culture, your own and the other, from these four perspectives. So A, A suggests how that, uh, let's say, the British uh, individual needs to know how the British see their own culture. So how A views A. B, A, uh, th that, that British individual will need to know how the other culture views British culture. So how Bulgarians view British culture. A, B, the British individual will need to know how the British culture views the other culture. So how the British view Bulgarian culture. And then finally, B, B, uh, the, the British individual will need to have an understanding of how the Bulgarians view their own culture. And if you can do all of these things, the idea is that you're going to be an effective communicator across cultures. Now, it's a very interesting diagram because there are programs out there that take aspects of this diagram, and try to put it in the classroom. And in many ways, some of the skills that we've covered and employers suggest are missing can be brought into the classroom using a uh, a plan like this, a plan for action like this, setting up opportunities for young people to be put in these situations for looking at their own culture, for seeing how the other culture views their own culture and so on and so on. Um, in, in my own experience of living and learning about Bulgaria, uh, there are many things I've picked up along the way, I think. Some of those, my own um, personal life skills uh, I'll pepper within my slides here. Uh, I think uh, picking up cultural heritage and traditions of, of the country you're either living in or your host country or, or you're learning about and you're, you're aspiring to, if you like, uh, is a wonderful um, life skill for young people to pick up and embrace in their learning experiences. And uh, <coughs> I've written down here in Lutenitsa. My f one of my early memories of living in Bulgaria is uh, autumn comes around, peppers are on sale, and you've got this wonderful aroma around uh, town walking about of roasting of peppers. And uh, I learned very quickly that a lot of families were making um, dishes to do with roast peppers. One of them is this amazing Lutenitsa, Bulgarian uh, mixture of uh, ground red peppers and aubergines and uh, spices and I think culturally it's the equivalent of uh, you know something that you imagine spreading on your toast I suppose marmite although nobody hates lutenitsa in Bulgaria like they do marmite uh, and, and I, I created a lesson in uh, the prep class in the English school I was working in was which was reasons to love Bulgaria. I think there were 85 reasons to love Bulgaria originally. And it was basically likes and dislikes. And I put in there things like Lutenitsa. And um, living in London for a few years, my wife, Bulgarian, was practicing to become a doctor in the health service. And uh, there's a newspaper called Budilnik in London for expat Bulgarians in the Bulgarian language. And in there, there was a letter uh, which was criticising everything Bulgaria, saying how happy they were to have escaped Bulgaria. Everything's horrible, dirty, corrupt, foul, and everything in England is lovely. And anyway, my wife took uh, uh, a little offence at this, and uh, she called me. I was travelling away and was asked me, where's that lesson that you wrote, 85 Reasons to Love Bulgaria? We dug it out, and she sort of tidied it up a little bit in Bulgarian. And we turned it into 135 reasons to love Bulgaria. So many amazing, simple aspects of life that, for me, were part and parcel of the wonderful experience I was having uh, in my new host country. And they published it in the newspaper. And here it is. Stoi tri spet pricini do bici in Bulgaria, kato čuždi net spekaro deset godini fnir. The original of this is in my Facebook profile, if anybody's interested in reading it. Cockles and Mussels <coughs> is a similar thing because there are lots of song items that are part of this, adopting this cultural heritage and traditions. And um, I think this is part of the opposite side of the exchange. A lot of young Bulgarians 
will learn these traditional British songs. Um, uh, here, uh, Molly Malone, Irish culture uh, uh, from the UK and Ireland. So moving on to skills, <coughs> critical thinking. Uh, uh, you can find a lot of materials on the net and that, that help young people look and make decisions and, and think critically about options available to them. Uh, looking at here, we've got disadvantages and advantages. And the context here I use in the workshop is um, arguing pros and cons. And you've got profile cards of employees and this company has to decide how to downsize, who to send home, who could do their work from home. Uh, and this creates uh, small group discussions, selecting, looking at the pros and cons of sending certain people's home from these profile cards. It's a very nice reading and interactive discussion activity for, for the kids in the classroom. And very specifically, they, they practice looking at and suggesting the advantages and disadvantages of certain people you know and, and for example in this activity um, the kind of people who can go home are those people who work with technology for example or who work with a telephone for example and you can see that by right, reading the cards and putting them forward as a suggestion the advantage of sending x home is that they can do most of their work on the telephone anyway and that would save some space so finding activities like that and putting them into the classroom uh, is a very good way of, of uh, practicing critical thinking activities, critical thinking skills. My own, my own personal life skill suggestion here is that I dot some through the slides. I, I also uh, frequently meet people who, who have this idea that if you want anything doing, give it to the busiest person you know. And I found this wonderful slide. It's actually fake. You can see it's fake. There were plenty of real photographs of severed fingers out there, but I thought, let's use a fake one. Um, and as speaking as a person who's, whose life has become very busy recently with two young children, a, a, a wife who's uh, got a very busy job with night shifts and all sorts of uh, long days, writing a book, opening a school, life became incredibly busy all of a sudden. There's very little free time left at all. And, I, and it occurred to me that I was changing uh, as this was happening. I was becoming much more ruthless with the things I agreed to do when people asked me to do things. I certainly wasn't part of this first quotation. You know, if people were asking me to do things because they know I'm busy, it's very likely that I'd say no. And I became more ruthless with my time. And I think the, the second quote is perhaps more true. But people in a rush shouldn't be given sharp knives to, to work with, expensive technology to, to use. I think actually, if you want something done, find the right person to do that job in whatever time it takes. Personal management skill. Uh, do it right, don't rush it, I think. And coming to the life skills list that we were looking at earlier, establishing priorities, solving problems. <coughs> you can put this in a simple discussion context. Uh, looking at things to do in your hometown uh, to produce a um, uh, tourist brochure of some kind. Looking at five things to do and, and then giving reasons for those five things such as uh, why you would do it, what's the intrinsic um, value or, or pleasure get, uh, that you get from doing this activity. Cost uh, is, is a factor. Is it expensive? Is it free? When? Uh, it might be seasonal, might be just once a week. And how much time is needed to do it? And if you get students to work in a small group like this, they can brainstorm initially on what those things are they can do in the hometown. And then they can prioritise based on these questions and come up with a finished list of five, uh, agreeing and disagreeing as they do that. And this uh, is set in the Open Mind textbook, course but one, I think, Unit 5, Establishing Priorities. Uh, and you can see here we've got the, the same activity set in this context of travel. Um, and within the life skills sub 
subsets of skills, we've got understanding criteria, listing the options and ordering the options according to the criteria in the same way that we set up in this slide with uh, the questions and things to do in your hometown. And you can see that on the slide that the language is, is quite uh, implicit. Uh, on this particular page, there's one little language box, how to say it, talking about things to do. And then we've got templates for writing. Uh, here we've got uh, um, some gap sentences with suggestions about things to do and the cost and the time it takes to do it. So it's not uh, <coughs> uh, an in-your-face way of looking at language. I quite like that myself personally. Uh, the language is there embedded on the page and through doing the activities the learners pick up the language. Personal life skill number three, expressing feelings. I have this game I play with my daughter um, and, and I think telling your nearest and dearest you love them as often as possible is a personal life skill. Um, I try to practice myself and we have this language game, walking to nursery or walking to school I think up something that uh, will get her thinking and and we express our uh, feelings for each other at the same time. So if my love for you were chocolate cake, you'd be able to feed the planet for a year and I get my daughter to do the same. And here you've got language within a psychosocial interpersonal um, context. To put that into the list of skills employers say young people need after school, let's tell each other we love each other. Um, negotiation skills. Um, this relates to an activity I do in the workshop with the teachers that looks at um, astronauts being out in space and meeting aliens and uh, looking at what if and practicing a, a piece of grammar within a context of uh, having to choose the right person for your needs. And this activity is taken from onestopenglish.com uh, uh, and the, the students in the class get a card, they're either an astronaut or an alien and they have certain needs and in reading about their needs they create a role for themselves and they need to talk to the other people in their group, find out who the aliens and the astronauts are and see who best fits the profile description on their card, who has what they need and at the same time they have things to offer and so what you find is you pair up an astronaut with an alien. Uh, I won't tell you anymore, you can go and find it and, uh, and download it but there's quite a lot of negotiating going on. You know, if you, if you help me, I'll help you. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So I think one of the points about showing this slide is if you want to create negotiation activities in your classroom, go out and find them and, and implement them. If there aren't any in your textbook, uh, there are certainly plenty on One Stop English uh, and other websites as well that you can download, have a look at, adapt maybe to suit your own thematic needs and grammatical needs and get young people negotiating with each other, practicing language through negotiation. And here's a, 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 a sort of a negotiation from the Open Mind book. And here we've got, for example, evaluating different plans, looking at construction plans within a green area in a town. Um, and the, the students have to establish important factors, evaluate how each plan affects these factors, and then put the plans in order of preference. So they've got three descriptions of how to develop the green area. Uh, look at the factors affected and then order the plans according to how they believe these affected factors are important. And again, let's have a look at the language. We've got a how to say it box. Uh, what effect will plan A have on? For example, plant life in the garden. Uh, plan A will have a very bad slash good effect. So let's give it a, a score, minus one or plus two. <coughs> Again, the language is embedded. It's embedded in the descriptions of the plans within the, the scoring system as well. Um, and it practices these subsets of skills within the life skill, evaluating plans. 
you can see where the language comes on the page with this highlighting I've put on the double page, uh, such as the will come, will be more, will be able structure here, which is repeated in the different descriptions of the plans. <coughs> There's some comparison too. Obviously, the plans need to be compared to each other. Um, estimating and guessing to give another double page spread as an example from the course book. Understanding what you need to estimate or guess. Do some simple calculations and compare your estimate to other data. And here we've got uh, personal uh, travel footprint. So how green people are in terms of their transport use, whether it's car, plane or other um, estimations in a year. And the language used. Um, making uh, you language for talking about numbers, um, language for giving estimations, comparing as well again, and then making suggestions about what to do uh, if it turns out that you are, you could be greener in your lifestyle. So the Open Mind course has kind of turned a general way of thinking about a language development kind of lexical grammatical progression onto its head to, to look at skills progression and develop lexis and grammar through the skills, uh, which I quite like as well. It, it's time uh, young people have the opportunity to develop skills they need and not necessarily hope they appear in a, in a lexical grammatical progression in a course book. Personal life skill number five, cultural awareness. Sing more songs together. I think classrooms should sing every day as much as possible and one of my favorite Bulgarian songs is Khubavasi Moya Goro which I won't sing for you but you can google it and uh, sing along there. Now I wanted to put this in a context in an educational program uh, so I'm going to I'm going to mention Science Across the World but I won't go through it. What you find in Science Across the World is uh, a collection of uh, study materials and exchange activities that produce the the cross-cultural competencies diagram uh, A on A, B on A, um, A on B, B on B matrix that I mentioned earlier. It gets young people to look at their own lives in, um, in many general science ways. It gets people to look at the lives of other people in other countries and make comparisons between lifestyle and behavior in a way that that diagram suggests is a good way to develop intercultural communicators. So although this is about general science, I think it creates uh, a context for developing intercultural skills in young people. Um, I'll just mention what it is. And you can see the website. It's actually hosted by the Association for Science Education today. But if you type in scienceacross.org, you'll find it. It's an exchange program for children working on general science topics between the ages of about eight today up to 18 or plus. And uh, there are about 20 topics in this uh, program written in six European languages and some other languages too. And one example you might want to have a look at is what did you eat? Number 13 on this list. It's a very common uh, focus for language textbooks anyway, looking at eating and drinking and health. And, and this gets young people to investigate their own lifestyles, present that data that they find from their investigation in a visual form, in a video form, in poster form, and exchange that with a partner in another country and have a look at the exchange material they receive from their partner, make comparisons. Wonderful opportunity for uh, sharing information about uh, each other's lives within a general science topic. It's not too difficult for language teachers. It's general science. It's not, not deep science. But I'm going to stop there because I think this is for another video um, and it will give you something to go away and browse. Uh, and I'll talk about it in another slideshow. Uh, at more length and stop here uh, with life skills and go away and do the workshop which is going to happen any moment when Dan comes knocking on the door. <laughs>